So Zephyr Teachout, what was it like for you to work with Adam Bello, who has a conservative reputation? Um, Adam has a great reputation as an editor, and he had worked with um, one of my favorite writers, uh, someone named Barry Lynn, um, who was one of the first to really punch through a consensus in economic thinking and say, hey, one of the problems we might have in America is a problem of concentrated economic power. Um, so when I set forth to uh, write this book that I'm writing about monopolies and what we can do about it, I, I was really excited to work with somebody who understood um, that there's a real moment in American economic thinking um, and we have an opportunity to reshape the way that we think about the economy and the relationship between the economy and the democracy. Aren't some monopolies, though, natural? <laughs> um, the, the, the point of my book um, is that we are in a moment of a crisis of concentrated economic power, and that's really threatening our democracy. And this concentrated corporate power is at the root of so many different issues that we see that we don't connect to concentration of power. Connect one for us. And, and, but to answer your question, um, there's this whole suite of tools in American history, including basic antitrust, breaking up big com companies, and also including saying once in a while there's going to be a company that we want to be really big and concentrated. But if it is going to be big and concentrated, some people talk about it in the language of natural monopoly, um, then w there's certain rules that have to apply. And I think of these broadly as all anti-monopoly rules. They're not just smash it up. They're also, if you're going to control the market, well, then you've got to be neutral. And you, you cannot discriminate in ways that you might be able to if you were just a small fish in a big pond. So we need new rules. We need to enforce the rules we have on hand. All of the above. Um, step one is recognizing the problem, is seeing that I think a lot of people feel this incredible uh, sense of uh, uncertainty and destabilization, and, and that we're, we have a crisis of powerlessness. And in fact, one of the sources of our democratic crisis is people feeling so out of power that uh, they either check out and don't vote or choose to vote uh, for somebody who they may not agree with, but it's just, who cares about my vote? Doesn't matter. I'm not connected to power anyway. And once you understand that the problem is a problem of power, then we can start looking at solutions. The solutions lie both in our history and in our future. Um, recovering all the tools that were used up until uh, 19, really 1981, which is when we stopped enforcing antitrust laws, but also saying, hey, we have some new puzzles. Um, the problem of big tech. How do we deal with Facebook and Amazon and Google that are similar to, but not the same as, some of the, uh, the monopolists of the Gilded Age. I'll, I'll give you an example of um, a, monopoly that, or a, a monopoly crisis that I think we can all relate to. Um, you may have heard about f farmers struggling, but at the same time, plenty of people are eating corn and <laughs> Uh, using soy products. So if you think about corn or soy farmers struggling, there's a mystery there. And the truth is there's a lot of money being made in farming. It's just not by the farmers. It's Monsanto, which has a monopoly over the seeds. John Deere, which has close to a monopoly over both the tractors and credit as farmers rely on John Deere for their lending. Bayer, um, which has, uh, is now merging with Monsanto. Um, and then ADM, which is often the sole buyer for farmers. So you can think of this farmer who we think of as the symbol of freedom in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, the independent farmer 
who still looks independent. It's still his or her own farm. We call him in our statistics an independent businessman or independent businesswoman. But all his or her choices are dictated by these four different companies that control their ability to farm at all. That far, that's a crisis in farming, but the more you look at different industries, the more you see the same thing is the middlemen taking all the value. And while they're taking that value, um, they're, they're also taking away freedom. So this is one of the things that um, Bernie Sanders talked about in his campaign, is that the amount of money for dollar made in agriculture for, by the farmer was going way down while money in farming was going way up. Why is that? It's because most farmers don't have choices of who to sell to. They don't have choices of who to buy from, and they don't have choices of who to borrow from. And when you start to be squeezed in all of these different ways, it's a financial crisis, but it's a freedom crisis too. Because those farmers are not waking up in the morning and saying, hey, I'm gonna read the most recent research and figure out the best way to plant my crops. They're saying, if I don't plant this way, I'm not going to be able to sell to ADM uh, or use Monsanto seeds. Zephyr Teachout, in your book, Break Them Up, you also are critical of the left and how they are fighting some of these issues. Well, I think uh, what we've seen is in, in 1981, um, the Reagan administration effectively dismantled our law history of anti-monopoly laws. But then Democratic presidents after Reagan didn't then revive them. Instead, we came to something close to a consensus that mergers were going to happen, uh, this uh, monopolization of the economy was just going to happen. And um, the left was, or Democrats, were split between those who too easily accepted um, the, the Reagan perspective, and those who so fundamentally rejected the idea of marketplaces and open markets that they weren't as interested in the anti-monopoly issue. I think that's changing now um, in some people's understanding, but what hasn't changed is we haven't had, and I call for in my book, we haven't had a national antitrust movement. <laughs> so as much as you might talk to a uh, progressive on the street about the problem of bon Monsanto and Bayer <laughs> merging, they shouldn't merge, I think almost any, any lefty I talked to would say, yeah, they shouldn't merge. But there weren't protests in the street about the merger. There weren't tens of thousands of phone calls to Congress members about it. <laughs> There, there wasn't the kind of um, grassroots activism showing that distaste. And I think part of the reason is that people, f even on the left, feel a sense of inevitability that these companies are just going to be able to do it, and it's not inevitable. A big p point of the book is that we have a choice. We don't have to have a concentrated economy. We don't have to have three companies control all of uh, chicken distribution and two companies control all of beer, uh, we can actually have a thriving, more innovative, more decentralized economy. You've personally attacked big government as well. I mean, you've run as an outsider for office. Well, those are two different, <laughs> two different things. Um, what I have been very critical of, and I think is important to recognize, is the areas where government, which is supposed to represent the public, in fact represents big business. Um, and uh, I've been very critical of the ways in which something in law we call regulatory capture, um, where big business, through revol the revolving door, or through um, campaign contributions, or through embedding themselves in the culture of Washington, so that your friends and your the people that you see on the street are all part of the same culture, has really taken over the ideology of Washington. I'll give an example. Um, I was involved in the, um, uh, I co-founded a, gr a 
grassroots group dedicated to breaking up big banks and to prosecuting more financial crimes after the financial crisis. And broadly put, there were two approaches to the financial crisis. One was more um, uh, uh, active antitrust. Let's actually break up the banks. Let, let's not allow them to become this threat to our stability that they became before. Just they can't if they're, if they're no longer the, the uh, behemoths that they have become. And the other was to say, uh, we need more um, uh, banking regulation. My belief is that you can't do number two until you do number one. That you can't have effective regulation until the handful of banks aren't actually controlling Washington. So that step one has to be, I'll put it another way, um, look at the world in terms of power and see the ways in which these big banks, uh, to some degree like big tech, have not just become big corporations, but have started to govern us. And in order for us to make our own rules for ourselves, we actually have to go at the heart of their power, not merely say, let's regulate a little more here and there. Why are you running for attorney general here in New York? Um, the attorney general in New York is probably the single most important legal office um, standing up against the lawlessness and corruption of the Trump administration. And my work on antitrust is deeply connected to my anti-corruption work. The more concentrated, unaccountable power you have, um, the more likely it is to serve itself. And we see a grotesque example of that in Donald Trump. Um, I also want to use the Attorney General's office as the tip of the spear on reviving a new antitrust movement in this country, showing how we can use New York state laws like the Donnelly Act, great antitrust act here in New York, um, and the brilliance of the lawyers in the AG's office to take on um, the mergers that we too often see as only federal affairs. Zephyr Teachout, her forthcoming book is called Break 'em Up. Here's the cover. This is Book TV on C-SPAN 2.